Warning, warning, this podcast contains spoilers. Listen at your own risk. Welcome to Medium Shift, the podcast that investigates how stories stack up from medium to medium through the adaptation process. I'm not doing the accent. <laughs> Why not? It's so appropriate. <laughs> what are we doing this episode, uh, F? <laughs> we're doing what we do in the shadows. That was more of a count than a vampire, but yeah. I'll take it. Are we doing Sesame Street? What? <laughs> <laughs> Plot twist. Welcome to Medium Shift. I'm Chris. And I'm Ev. <laughs> I, I won't do the accent for the whole episode, as fun as that would be. Um, I don't even know what that accent is. I just affiliate it with vampires, but I guess it's Transylvanian more than anything. I mean, yes. the fact that it, I'm doing it so terribly does not help no. as well, but... Just try your New Zealand accent. That's more appropriate and less... <laughs> Uh, racist? <laughs> sure, sure. I, it's a good point, but I don't want to do a Kiwi accent for the whole thing as well. It's just going to be me saying fudge and shops over and over again. <laughs> it's really the only thing I can do to give myself a Kiwi accent. Uh. Oh, I like my ancestry. Anyway, yes, we are doing what we do in the shadows. The uh, 2019 continuing on. Like this, We're only going to be talking about the first season because yep. season two has not come out at the point of this recording. Though there will be a season two in the future. Um, this is the TV series on FX based on the, I believe, 2014 film called What We Do in the Shadows, directed by Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement, a New Zealand mockumentary movie. Um, and without further ado, what did we think of the series? I was a little unsure. I'll, I'll put it out there. Especially at in the first couple of episodes, it just didn't feel like it was sitting right. It mm. seemed to get better for me. As the season progressed. Sure, okay. And it sort of found its own as a separate entity rather than a mm. trying to be as close an adaptation as possible. Sure. Uh, I found some of the characters, especially some of the new, newish uh, additions, like the mm. uh, idea of the emotional vampire. Oh, yeah, sure. Hit and miss. Colin Robinson. Yes. <laughs> yep, yep. Like the uh, s- scenes where he's like, in the forefront and some of the episodes where he's sort of being more of a commanding and leading presence, mm. I absolutely loved. Mm. But the other times where he's just sort of there and sort of mm. felt like awkward and shoehorned in and I couldn't work out if I, if it was worth him being around for all those other bits, which just kind of took away for the most of the scene mm. for the scenes where he is actually really good and right. at the forefront. Like in the third episode where it's like an entire subplot surrounded around just him oh, in that's the workplace. Right. And the um the other vampire in his workplace. Yes. Yes. Well, I've forgotten the name of right now. But yes, yes, I know yes, the episode Evie. you're talking about. That's the one. Yep. Yes. Mm. The emotional vampire. That's the one. Yep. Yes. Uh, but the one thing I do absolutely have to give major props to for the TV show is the casting director. Mm-hmm. Uh, whoever that is. <laughs> Did a fantastic job. Oh, yeah. Yep. Even a lot of, like, the smaller characters that are in there are cast perfectly. Mm. Absolutely love uh, Vanessa Bayer as Evie, the emotional vampire that we talked about. Yep. Uh, Nick Kroll pop- popping up mm. as the Manhattan, or however they pronounce it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always forgot he was in the series. Damn. Mm. And we can't... I mean, this is one episode that I want to talk about, where we will have to talk about episode seven at some point, too. Oh, yes. The trial. <laughs> Talk about casting. Oh, boy. <laughs> I was leading up to it. <laughs> yep, yep. Ooh, and I also have to... I love the fact that they've just gone for... Uh, when going for the were- the head werewolf, they just went with someone else who was in Flight of the Concords. Yeah, sure. I, it feels apt, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's very cool. Interesting. Um, Yeah, I mean, I... I really like this series, quite frankly. I should. Uh, one thing we should definitely talk about is our affinity with the original film, mm. too, obviously, because that is going to cloud how we perceive this movie. Um, I saw the TV ori- series. Yeah, sorry. I see the TV series. That is too many things. Um, yes, no, I saw the original film, uh, not in cinemas or anything like that. I saw it just after it came out. It was recommended to, recommended to me by a friend. Um, I knew nothing about Taika Waititi at this point anything like that this was all entirely new and it was 
one of the funniest comedies I've ever seen. Like, legitimately, I I saw it uh, with, like, a fairly large group of people, and by God, I swear I missed half the movie because people were laughing so hard and so consistently. And I, I, I don't know if I've had a better comedy viewing experience than the first time I saw What We Do in the Shadows. Um, and I've still loved it subsequent. I've seen it, like, so many times at this point. I know it incredibly well because I just rewatch it all the time. Um, and I think the movie is fantastic. And I think this TV series, in many respects, is just, like, a really solid, like, continuation or recreation of it. It doesn't quite have the same hit the zeitgeist for me, personally, as the original film did. But it's, like, more of everything that I loved in the original movie. And to me, that's, like, totally okay. I mean, you can kind of tell that it's very similar and that it obviously has a lot of uh, involvement from Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement, the original directors... It feels very much in the same spirit of, it's just more of it. And considering how much I love the original stuff, more of it for me is totally fine. So Yeah, yeah I definitely agree with you on that point. Especially, I think if they went for more of a direct adaptation, it would not have worked yeah, no, no, no. at all. You would but not the fact wanna... that they're just sort of yeah. basically just fleshing out this universe mm. and they just went, okay, we've got those characters over in New Zealand, let's just focus on some ones in America. Yeah, sure. And it works. Mm. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. It's um we we'll get into this obviously, but I think there's a lot of very interesting and smart things they do, changing it from a film to a TV series. But honestly, I think the film in many respects lent itself to a TV format incredibly well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think they've taken full advantage of it. I think the casting is great. I think all three leads are yes. fantastic. Well, four leads if you count Guillermo. I don't I don't know how exactly he fits in there, but yeah, either way, I'd go for it. Yeah, yeah sure. He gets slighted enough. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's great. I think there's some really, really fun concepts and episodes and ideas in here. Like with all series, like even great comedy series that people like Harold is like The Office and Seinfeld mm-hmm. and things like that. Not every episode is a standout, but mm-hmm. I think there's enough in each episode that I still enjoy it irrespective. And there are obviously standout episodes in there, like episode seven. I still, yep. <laughs> episode seven I rewatched just last night for this episode. And <laughs> it's so stupid, but it's, it's genuinely delightful. Yes. Um, and I think, yeah, I like, I love the film enough that it being just more of it is totally mm. fine by me. So, so yeah, uh, I should probably bring up my context for the film as well. The original, because mine is kind of a similar experience, although I had heard of uh, heard and seen Taika Waititi before. Sure. Uh, I'd been told a lot about uh, Eagle vs. Shark and Boy mm. before mm. this, and I'd seen clips from it. I hadn't seen the full movies mm. until after my first viewing of What We Do in the Shadows. Mm. Uh, but I sort of had a rough idea that this was going to be very different to the mainstream thoroughfare that was coming through this was going to be something unique and truly mm. uh offbeat one offbeat, might say yeah yeah sure yeah and very much that sort of australia new zealand sense of humor oh yes <laughs> which i thoroughly appreciated yes. more new zealand sense of, like obviously big but surprise like, it's mm. made by kiwis and set in wellington so. yes <laughs> yeah it's very much that sort of new zealand polite comedy kind of thing mm. that they, uh tucker has talked about talked about before mm. and it just works you don't expect to laugh and be like sympathetic with a character as he's murdering someone. Mm. Yep. That's but that's true. what happens uh, with Tiger's character in mm. the movie that he plays as well as the, how he directs. And Jermaine Clement mm. is really good at doing those uh, sort of em- emotional, like subtle emotional arcs that go through the whole thing whilst keeping the snarkiness mm. on top. You can actually... It's one of the few characters that can be snarky that you actually root for mm, as sure. a character and feel bad for when he falls into old habits mm, and such. Yep. But yeah, so I sort of had an idea. Uh, I also had seen Green Lantern, so I sort of knew Tiger through there. But... <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> so this certainly changed Poor my guy. mind on his performance. <laughs> <laughs> good he to was know. Actually, he was actually good in Green Lantern. I feel, him and Ryan Reynolds, I think... He was. They have a good actually, dynamic together. They have a good yeah. dynamic. And look... that's proved through... A lot of their sort of friendship mm. from then on. And banter since then, basically. Yes. Yeah, so this is going to date when this episode comes out. But there's a film coming out uh, soon, like called Free Guy, basically, where Ryan Reynolds mm. is playing an NPC in the city. Taika Waititi is in it too. And they did an interview together, like very clearly set up, where they completely refused to acknowledge that they'd worked yes. together <laughs> on Green Lantern. They're like, no, no, that movie doesn't exist. No, no, this is best new friends, best new friends we've never met before in our lives. So. I don't know, something about their senses of humor, even though they're both quite distinct, 
Um, they seem genuinely compatible in a lot of ways. And yes. yeah, I, I look, look forward to seeing them working together in the future, yes. I'm sure. And the greatest yeah. uh, sign of Canadian, New Zealand and Australian uh, mm. diplomatic uh, connections is through Ryan Reynolds, Taika Waititi and Hugh Jackman. That's true. And that entire... <laughs> <laughs> Those three should make a movie together. Yes. So desperately. That would be so good. Um, Taika Waititi is an interesting one because he does have a very distinct... Um, not only direction, but also type, like sense of humor. Like since I have seen what we do in the, after I saw what we do in the shadows, I went back, watched all of his previous films. I've seen all of his films since then. Like I'm, I would consider myself a huge Taika Waititi mm. fan now, largely because of the film, what we do in the shadows. That was my introduction. Um, and I think you're absolutely right in that he does have this very kind of light sensibility of comedy, like mixed with politeness and also mixed with like genuine pathos at the same time. Like we've talked about it before, I think in relation to a do it differently, but I think Taika Waititi is one of the best people at balancing drama and comedy at the same time. And while I think what we do in the shadows is definitely more of a comedy than it is a drama, there are still light dramatic elements to it. And I think they gel really well, especially through Jermaine Clement's character, as you were talking about with the rest of the comedy um, and even though the TV show, I think, is very, very funny, every now and then it has those light, dramatic touches too. Yeah, I mean, if anything, it feels like big surprise because a lot of the episodes in the What We Do in the Shadows TV series was written and directed by Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement. Like, yeah. they were heavily involved. They were executive producers. And it really does feel like their creative spirit is still alive and well in the series in the same way it was in the film, which I think is great. And once yeah. again, feels very familiar and very similar, but I'm more than okay with that. So now that we've bored our entire audience with our just long history uh, and anecdotal... It's important. It's important. It's relevant. Yes. We're talking about the film and the show, so... <laughs> Do we want to yeah. actually start, like, delving into the TV show itself and how it mm. works yeah. as an adaptation? For sure. I mean, obviously, changing it from a film to a TV series, like, changing mm. mediums in that respect, the, the way the story is being told and presented and all that is going to change... I think in a lot of ways, this premise works better as a TV show, better than it does a film. Um, okay. Not only because, uh, like, the mockumentary style has a long history in TV, particularly over the last 10, 20 years. Like, shows like, you know, The Office and Modern Family and, like, really, really popular series that use this kind of mockumentary style, cut away to the camera, that kind yeah. of thing. It means that there is a long enough legacy there that, like, another mockumentary style show fits into that echelon incredibly well. But also because I think... A lot of the comedy in the original film comes from the fact that they are vampires seen through a slice of life perspective. Mm. And if anything, TV shows lend themselves much more to that kind of slice of life. This is what we're doing in our daily business kind of thing, even more than the film does, frankly. Um, if like in a lot of respects, like even though the film obviously has a bit of an ongoing storyline, even if it's a little bit loose and things like that, I really think the more kind of relaxed uh like mm, relaxed storytelling approach i guess just fits this tv series better because it's more like this is what we're doing today kind of thing in a way that the film film does that but it's obviously in a very different format so yeah that was my feeling of it at the very least yeah okay i'm weirdly like following your exact same reasoning mm. but going for like the opposite i felt the movie actually did this like the overarching storylines better okay than the tv show mm. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe it's just because I've spent enough time and like delve deeply on a surface level. The TV mm. does it a lot better. But like mm. when you've like properly sat down and analyzed everything and mm. discussed it uh, and gone through the full motions mm. of trying to deep dive on a film, I think the movie actually does a lot better. Mm, okay, as in like overarching storyline wise, or overarching story, the character development, the sort of very intricate. Mm way it sort of treats both jokes mm. uh, in the direct moment and in the overarching idea sure the smaller segments just seems to sort of i don't know gel a bit better but at the same time i think the tv show w with your whole slice of life mm. idea it works a lot better on just sort of mm. getting those like smaller moments the smaller arcs mm. so i think the slice of life slice of life stuff is a lot better in the TV show than it was in the movie because it can sort of spread things out over a long, longer period of time. And so it does that smaller, mm. uh, smaller stories and little sort of subplots and anecdotal uh, moments a lot better than the movie would have. Mm. Whereas the movie overall 
is great, but if you take out smaller bits, yes, it's funny, but it doesn't have the same impact. Sure, sure. I mean, obviously, like, the way storytelling operates uh, in film and TV is very different in many Mm. respects. Um, I think the best way to describe it, obviously, television in many respects is defined by the connections between its episodes. Basically, the continuation or lack of continuation of storylines from one episode to the next as such. Whereas a film has everything self-contained. So I think at least in a film, you can build over a longer period of time within one self-contained thing um, towards some sort of like, you know, unified story, basically. But in television, that is played out over a longer period of time. So I think it's an interesting point regarding the overarching story because I think the TV show obviously has more to breathe. When Mm. we talk about overarching storylines, like there isn't really a ton of ongoing stories in the TV series. Like there's the stuff regarding Guillermo and slowly (laughs) discovering that he might be uh, like a descendant of Van Helsing and a secret amazing vampire (laughs) killer, (laughs) which I think is very fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's the relationship between Naja and... um, Laszlo. Laszlo as well, so which they obviously kind of build on over yeah. time and whatnot. Um, but outside of that, it's all very, like, eh, a lot more disconnected, like, this is genuinely what mm. we're doing, and this is, like, a side story that doesn't necessarily have relevance to our character yep. or to any of the ongoing arcs and things like that. Um, but I think I think it still works totally fine, honestly, in both respects. Mm. I think the storytelling... I, obviously, I love the film, too, but I just think the TV show, you have to take a slightly different approach, and I think because of that... It works really well with the premise. So yes, yeah, uh, I yeah, uh, I definitely agree. They've mm. they've worked out exactly how to make this the right ad- adaptation for TV and focused heavily on that for sure. I should be able to pick that up. I think more than anything, the mockumentary style is it, obviously it has been used in film a lot as well. Yeah. But I think because there is a bit of a heritage in television, it is easy to buy that series also being adapted to TV too. Because I mean, like. Yeah. The moment they do a cutaway and it's, like, two people being interviewed in a room or something, anyone who has seen, like, contemporary comedies like The Office or Parks and Rec or Modern mm-hmm. Family understands that format, I think, in a way, and means that they can they can basically indulge in it um, to a greater extent, I think, than the film. Obviously, because they have more time, too, which therefore means more jokes mm. and therefore a more relaxed storytelling approach and so on and so forth. So, um, I don't really want to... I, this is a bit of a weird question, but I mean, I don't necessarily want to compare the two of them, but from what you're saying before, you it feels like the film works a little bit better than the show for you. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't want to say that. Okay. Uh, I mean, it is an apples to oranges comparison yeah. in a lot of respects. Yeah, certainly. It is. It's just a new take on the universe rather than an actual mm. story, so it's hard to compare. It's kind of just the same story world it is it's literally the same story world but mm. just yep. two completely story different stories told within it sure the sure. only real connection is the fact that it's vampires mm. sharing a house mm. yeah it's true like the general premise is the mm. same it's just different people in a different part of the world yes. and so on and so forth so and so when i was talking about the movie i did generally prefer the way it told its story mm. uh but i think at the same time you can't discount the TV show in what it does. And also the way the TV show actually built up the world. Mm. I found a lot more uh, interesting and entertaining mm. than it did. There was Because it can do that longer format, you can introduce all these smaller stuff into it mm. that the movie kind of has to rush over. Sure. Like all the other different types of supernatural creatures that live in here. Mm. Like the episode with the witch... The witch hat made out of witch skin. And... <laughs> yep, that's right. That's right. It is an interesting yeah. point in that you can kind of fill in the gaps in this universe that it is a lot of that classic supernatural stuff. Like, we haven't really talked mm. about how the original film was inspired by vampire lore and things, but it's like mm. all the general conventions you would assume of vampires, like being afraid of sunlight, crucifixes, things like that. I think Jermaine Clement has come out and said, like, they're basically drawing on the um the vampire rules from films from the 70s and 80s like the lost boys yeah. and things like that um and all that i think is plainly apparent but i do think it is funny uh that the tv show goes into a lot more of the mythology in the world than the film does obviously because mm. it has more time but stuff yeah. like the the baron um the um the reincarnation of that guy over and over yes. again i find it very weird gregor how- Gregor, oh sweet Gregor, um, I find it very, very weird and funny at the same time that they basically confirm reincarnation in this universe, and it's yeah. just like completely nonchalant. People just <laughs> accept it as the way it is, but I mean that makes sense for the kind of 
the fact that everyone is an immortal vampire. <laughs> um, yeah, so a bunch of those, like, little, like, even the, the trial episode when they have, like, the, um, the, uh, court of vampires and everything like that. There's basically, like, they flesh out the world a lot more because they have the time mm. and the space to do so. And I think that's fun. And I think all of those additions are really, really funny for the most yes. part. So, yeah. So, I think we, it seems like you really want to talk about episode seven. I want to talk about episode seven, okay? I want to talk about the trial. <laughs> so I, I while I was watching it, I noted down every person in the episode and all the people that they reference to. So for people who aren't familiar or people who don't quite remember, episode seven uh, occurs uh, at, after the end of episode six, where Guillermo accidentally killed the Baron with sunlight. Then they get summoned to this basically vampire council to determine whether they are uh, culpable for the crime and whatnot. Um, and the council is basically consists of all these real world celebrities pretending to be vampires <laughs> it's it's wild and i'm ama- i mean the way they shoot it you can clearly tell that they were not all in the same room at the same time mm. like it's very very clear that all these people like they just got them on a sound stage or yeah. like the green screen or something like that and then just cut them all together but i think that makes it even funny in some respects to the point that they even acknowledge it through wesley snipes yes. skyping in <laughs> like they didn't even get wesley snipes in they just knew i was like oh we're not all really here honestly <laughs> like oh, it's just all right so i want to go through the group of people so it's got obviously the original three so taika watiti jermaine clement and johnny brew mm-hmm. um and then also funnily enough they all get referred to by their first name so they're clearly playing themselves mm. but themselves as vampires we've got tilda swinton Evan Rachel Wood, Danny Trejo, Paul Rubens, Wesley Snipes, as Blade, <laughs> I want to specify. They call him the Daywalker. Yeah. He's half vampire and someone accuses him of being a vampire hunter, which basically confirms he is Blade in this universe, <laughs> which means the Blade trilogy is also canon, which I don't understand how to reconcile that with what we do in The Shadows, frankly, but it is an idea that gives me great delight. Um, Wesley Snipes, Christian Sale, and then Dave Bautista as well. <laughs> Very, very... He's not even part of the council. They had that many people that they just chucked him in another room. <laughs> um, and then they mention other people as well, like uh, other like Kiefer Sutherland couldn't make it, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. Like, basically all these Hollywood celebrities that they're subtly implying are vampires in real life. <laughs> and <laughs> it's such a stupid joke. And the scene is so weird and constructed, but so, so funny at the same time. <laughs> I think that episode is like the peak of them playing and experimenting with this universe basically in this way because they mm. kind of do something similar to Men in Black in that Men in Black will like subtly hint that people in the real world are actually aliens yep. and they basically play with those real world expectations inside this universe and it's not something that the series or the film had done up to that point and so to suddenly throw all of these celebrities at the mm. wall with all this really weird banter going back and forth I took me completely by surprise and I thought was absolutely hilarious and very, very clearly Taika Waititi just calling in a bunch of favors. He's, yeah. he's such a popular guy in Hollywood now and he so deserves it. And I think the scene really <laughs> exemplifies it. Um, yeah. I, that is my favorite episode of the season. Yeah. Absolutely. That's yeah. Right. yeah. And it, it's also a really interesting uh, look from a critical academic look into things, which mm. is weird to say for a, <laughs> Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement directed episode of an hey, American TV series. Yep. Uh, but the entire scene would not work mm. without, if it was without the ideas of adaptations, paratexts, mm. and the shared universe. Oh yeah, it's funny because we are familiar with these people yes. and have connotations with these people. Like openly mm. admitting that Tilda Swinton is a vampire is funny Fun- yeah. because it's Tilda Swinton. <laughs> yeah. And then you throw in a. But there's also, just beyond the fact that it is the celebrity personas, a lot Mm. of those also are linked to actual, like, supernatural film series in their own right. You already Mm. mentioned Blade. Mm. You have Tilda Swinton in the Constantine movie, sort of already touching in on that Oh, yeah, she played an angel in those films. Yeah, I forgot about that. A Mm. fallen angel. Oh, yes. Which is already quite linked in with vampire vampire lore Mm. as is. Mm. There you go. And that sort of aristocratic lore. Yep. Danny Trejo played a vampire in... um, uh, what's it called? I'll look it up. Dusk Till Dawn? Don't forget, yes, from Dusk Till Dawn. That's the one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you've got this whole sort of multiple layers mm. that even just by itself, if you didn't know who any of these people are, it's still very funny. Mm. But then there's so many extra layers mm. that get added to it that it 
and you don't need to know all the layers for it to sort of mm. blend in perfectly. Mm. It is like a perfect example of how to do paratextual mm. uh, joke telling. Comedic references, basically. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, Wesley Snipes coming in on a webcam over Skype is like genuinely funny in itself. But yes. Having all that further context that he was played and he went to prison, <laughs> which is potentially where he's Skyping from. And all these additional references, I yeah, just mm. adds to the comedy, if anything. So it's a very... It's a it's it's a great scene in that it is funny without all of that context, but it is yep. even funnier with it. And I think yep. that is, as you're saying, that's a really good paratextual comedy. And it's also a really interesting. You brought up the fact that it is theoretically now part of the Blade mm. universe. I guess, yeah. Which I mean is not like <laughs> true, mm. but it's a fun little thing. We like. There are so many ways that fans sort of connect, mm. uh, and when connect and fill in their own sort of gaps with imaginations and Mm. i mean you can look at like uh fan theories the subreddit and Mm. that's just filled with people filling in the gaps with their own Mm. ways and it's and when a tv show allows Mm. that kind of thing or a movie or whatever Mm. allows that sort of interpretation it's Mm. always so much better Mm. just jokingly references it and then you can take it in whatever direction you want so because i mean like the rules of the blade universe do not coincide with the rules of the while we're doing the Shadows Universe, and they're not supposed to. It's just, it's a funny reference, which kind mm. of adds this whole other layer of meaning, which I think is very amusing and yeah. very fun to think about. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, uh, that is... I reckon we could do an entire thesis on that one episode <laughs> if we try hard enough. It's it's very fun and just very funny as well. Yes. I think it's the only time in the season that they acknowledge the cameramen as well. No, no, there's a few times that they... Oh, they do, but, like, no, we actually see the cameramen oh, yes. on screen. Yeah. yeah, just stuck at the bottom of the well. <laughs> uh, they're in grave danger. You should definitely go save them. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very, very fun. <sighs> yeah, but no, really, really yes. great episode. Oh, oh, other thing I have to mention as well. But do you know who plays the Baron? Uh, no. Doug Jones. Do you know who Doug Jones is? That he, sounds familiar. Oh, he plays I'm... the monsters in like all of Guillermo del Toro's movies. Yes. He was the fish man in um, Shape, Shape of Water. Of Water. I yes. think he played no, the Pan in Pan's Labyrinth, but I couldn't yep. mistake him into that. He was the fish man in uh, Hellboy as well, <laughs> funnily enough. And <laughs> it's just... Which is another... <laughs> A uh, point to my theory that The Shape of Water and Hellboy exist in the same universe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun idea, actually. <laughs> there you go. Paratextual references. Um, yeah. Um, and I think I just, that was a little fact I figured out. I discovered while looking at the um, the IMDb page and I'm like, that makes mm. so much goddamn sense. And once again, I think points do one of those like references, as you were saying, because it's people who are familiar with Doug Jones very clearly know that that would be the type of role that he plays yeah. <laughs> and he was clearly having a great time with it so mm. the baron is a fun character i think yeah he's pretty dour to begin with but that episode when he goes out on the town <laughs> <laughs> is also one of my favorites yeah i will admit as soon as he came up i'm like oh i'm not liking this character and he's doing the big voice and then he, mm. and then he just sort of like coughs and starts talking normally i'm like okay yeah i'm in yeah, yeah that works that works this works this was pretty out for the series yeah so, yeah it was great i think um, I mean, is there anything else we want to talk about regarding the series or the adaptation or anything? Like, once again, like, it takes the loose premise of the original film yeah. and then adapts it to a different medium. Um, mm. That's generally it. Like, there's nothing really to talk about regarding Fidelity because it's brand new characters. Yep. All the lore is the same, everything like that. It takes place in the same universe. If anything, it's you should consider it a spin-off more than mm. an actual adaptation. So, yeah, just part of the same series, basically. Yep. Yeah. Um, but no, anything else you want to chat about? Uh, again, I just kind of want to gush over mm. all of the, uh, actors. Mm. Uh, Matt Berry specifically mm. is just a delight in everything he's in. Yep. Everyone uh, in this show is great. Oh, yes. I don't think they there was a weak performance perfectly. in here. Yeah. Even the emotional vampire, which as a character, I still am on the fence about. Mm. It was still played to perfection mm. by... The name who I am for I don't know. Right I just now. keep referring to him as Colin Robinson. Yes, Colin Robinson, mm. played by Mark Prosk. That's right. He's been in a bunch of stuff. I think I've recognised him. Yeah, he, yeah, he's one of those. Uh, the, mm. This is basically the TV show for. Oh, that's that guy from somewhere else. I recognise them. I'm mm. not quite sure. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. 
But no, it is a. It oh, is yeah, a... it was in the office, the US version. Oh yes, of course. So he's very renowned for the. Uh, there you go, mockumentary, mockumentary style. style. He's well and truly in his element. Yes. Yeah. Um. But no, I think if anything, if you like the original film, you'll really like this show. I mm-hmm. think it is just great straightforward television comedy i think it's very funny Mm. i think um it's very smart with its premise it's it's a lot more intelligent than the really stupid jokes would sometimes make (laughs) you believe um even this is one thing i didn't expect as well but i kind of want to see the next season not only because i enjoy this show but also because i want to see where they go with the guillermo character Mm. like i was not anticipating getting uh, <laughs> that invested in that little like <laughs> suggestion at yeah. the end of this season more than like it was just a really fun cliffhanger I think and I really look forward to see how they how they handle that going forward which is great um, and yeah I think it's a really great show yeah, yes genuinely there is actually something I just sort of you vaguely reminded me of mm. that I wanted to talk about is the fact that it is an American adaptation of a New Zealand uh, mm. movie yep. They, American adaptations don't generally go as well as they've done. It doesn't suck, does no. it? No. It could have been so much worse. And it, yep. it it does perfectly what those better, like like The Office US, it mm. does what it did and it adapts it to the right audience that it's going for mm-hmm. while still keeping the spirit of the jokes alive. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the comedy is somewhat Americanized to mm. a certain extent. Like, I did notice that. Yes. Um, which didn't bother me too much because it still felt no. very much in the spirit of the original mm. uh, that it, it, I thought it was still fine. If anything, I feel it actually kind of worked to its advantage because it was like these very aristocratic foreign characters. None of them were American. Mm. Yep. And then just hearing them make jerk-off jokes, mm. you're like, that is a weird contrast, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it works. So. Yeah. Um, I think it really, really the reason it succeeds is because it had the involvement of the original creative team. Oh, yes. If someone else ad- um, adapted this, like a new creative team and Taika Waititi and Jermaine Clement were not involved, mm. I really don't think it would be anywhere near as good or interesting or faithful. So um, yeah. that is clearly the secret ingredient for why I think it is so great. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, is there anything we want to touch on or should we move into do it differently? Uh, let's try and... <laughs> Do it differently? Do it differently, yeah, I guess. Jingle, jingle, jingle. 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 Yeah. Jingle. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you first or shall I? Uh, you go. Okay, cool. Um, well, mine, once again, is like, since I really like this show, and I don't know if there's too many things I would change regarding adapting it, the only thing I could genuinely think of was, like, keeping it in New Zealand rather than Americanizing it a- not as much. Okay. Um, but... Outside of that, what I would prefer to do, honestly, um, this is actually something that is in production, but they are making a sequel to what we do in the shadows right now called Werewolves, mm. like We Are Wolves, yep. centered around basically the werewolves. And part of me kind of wants that to be a series rather than a film. Okay. Um, not only because I think, oh, look, I think what the TV show is great. Um, it is very similar to the original film. And I think... If you did a spin-off looking at a different supernatural race while still being in the same vein, it would be just dis- more distinct and distinct enough for it to kind of stand on its own without us implicitly comparing it to the original film. So honestly, I would kind of want to see uh, keep the original movie, this TV series could still exist as well, but like have another spin-off series looking at a pack of werewolves in the same supernatural universe and kind of the shenanigans that come out of that. I think it'd be just another really fun take. There's a lot of different things you can do with werewolves that you can't do with vampires. Um, And I just think it would make for a really fun premise that they want them to see them do, which they will eventually do in the other film. But I don't know. Just part of me thinks it would work better as a series than it would a film. So, yeah, that's me. Not a whole lot to suggest. It's just, yeah, I really like the show. I really like the film. I just want to see more of this universe. Mm. So we've sort of... Again, going for really similar takes. Oh, God damn it. Which I think... We should really prep this beforehand. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's a good point in the fact that because we are thinking so similar mm. and so minimal that it's because it is such a good... Uh, it's a testament to the show and the movie itself, mm. honestly. But anyway, my one, it is focusing on different supernatural characters. It'd still be set in America. I think that kind of works. Sure. This kind of fish out of water. But it, mine is more akin to what is going to be one of my uh, 
recommendations in random talk okay but it's a basically the prototype uh, mockumentary tv series in people like us oh i've heard of it but i don't know Mm. very much about it for those who don't know it was just your classic sort of mockumentary where it was a sort of host director person and his camera crew each episode going to different people to look at their lives kind of thing and sort of expands out and follows them like very much sort of classic old british uh mm. documentaries mm, where sure. it was just almost like news report but it was mockumentary style so it was and very improvisational where it was just sort of thrown together sure so mine would be something more like that so each episode following a different supernatural being all in the lead up like and follow sort of the original premise of the movie which was mm. sort of in the lead up to a the monster ball mm. but it was following just the vampires mine would be lead up to the monster ball but following different people uh, and creatures as they get ready oh. and then the last episode have the actual ball itself where you can have them all interacting and such i really like that idea yeah. that's really cool it's like one episode yeah. would be of course uh, following a vampire the second one would be a werewolf the third mm. would be a witch kind of thing stuff mm. like that sure and sure. so each thing and then you can sort of have little bits of crossover but sort of all very self-contained mm. and just flesh out the world and focus on what the TV show did best, which was this world creation and story building. Mm. So yeah, that is my do it differently. Yeah. Fantastic. I think that is a really, really fun idea. Mm. And yeah, it would be so fantastic to see like the slice of life for so many other supernatural creatures in this mm. same vein. It's really, really good. Yeah. I'm going to steal yours instead. No. <laughs> um, yeah. No, fantastic. Yeah. I think it is a, It is a testament to this universe, this show, and this film that rather than trying to change anything, we frankly just want to see more different takes in the same world. So, yeah, I think the the film is genuinely delightful, and I think the show is just more of it, which I'm okay with. So, yeah. So, speaking of more of things, Mm. what have you got to recommend more of? Whoa, he's thrown it. Is this the first time you've started the random recommendations it's normally no oh, no you've done it before yeah i don't you've know done it before i don't know either way it's not like we keep track of this thing Goodness. you can barely remember what we did the last episode on clue no and no wait crap what was the last episode um this is not a bit i legitimately yep. can't remember right now <laughs> wait moving on um no no i gotta figure this out it was on it was at your play oh. it was it was god damn it <laughs> What was it? I'm going to look it up. Super Mario Bros? Or was it Injustice? No, it would have been Super Mario Bros. Yeah, Super Mario Bros. Yeah, and then Injustice was the previous one. Rec- yes. Yeah, we recorded those two episodes back to back, so completely forgot. God, okay. I was just doing it as a jerk. <laughs> no, I legitimately could not remember. <laughs> um. Yep, anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this episode, I'm going to recommend um, something related to Taika Waititi, uh, which was his... Uh, the film he made after What We Do in the Shadows. It's a New Zealand uh, comedy drama called uh, Hunt for the Wilder People. Such a good film. It's really, really fantastic. This is one of my favorite films. This is probably my favorite New Zealand film. I like it even more than What We Do in the Shadows. Um, one of my f- my favorite Taika Waititi film. It is, it's, it's really difficult to kind of put into words why I love it so much, but there's just a perfect mix of like, comedy and drama and pathos well it's incredibly entertaining while still being really touching at the same time uh it's quite thoughtful it's really sweet um and i just recommend everyone watch it it just feels like such a crowd pleaser movie that i could i could recommend Mm. this movie to almost anybody and i feel like they would enjoy it which seems to be a rare occurrence these days especially for films that i like (laughs) too um yeah so i think it is fantastic if you like takuatiti if you like what we do in the shadows you really enjoy this movie because it has a very similar sensibility, even if it is a little bit more dramatic. Um, and I think it is uh, absolutely worth checking out. And it was like was a huge success in New Zealand as well. Like mm. really, really beloved film. And I think it is well deserved because I love it. Excellent. Well, I've got two recommendations this week. Ooh. So for those, is that illegal? <laughs> I've never done two recommendations <laughs> before. <laughs> it's my podcast. I make the rules. That's true. Yeah. Well, our podcast, but yes, sure. I will allow. I still make the time. rules. <laughs> Fine. Anyway, <laughs> carry on. Yeah. So my first recommendation is for those who really like the mockumentary style mm-hmm. of these kinds of shows, uh, and that would be what I mentioned earlier: people like us. Hmm. A fantastic little British short 
mockumentary series, Fallen Lives, a great little sort of snapshot of Britain. It's got one of the early appearances of David Tennant, which is lovely. Oh, awesome. He's the focus on the actor episode. Mm. It's it's one of those just very subtle comedies mm. that, like, sometimes you can just miss a joke and then watch it again. Like, oh, that was actually mm. funny. Mm. Like, one of my favorites that I remember for some reason is just working in a police station and then the guy's just, like, at a fax machine just chatting about it. And it's like, oh, what's happening? Oh, um, the guy at the other precinct is just faxing over... Uh, some spare uh, blank paper for us. <laughs> and then just can, carries on. <laughs> That's quite good. <laughs> yeah. So, it. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it is, and it is sort of like the mm. prototypical modern TV mockumentary. Mm. This was like early 2000s. Mm, okay. Was. Yeah. Yeah, that is kind of early, honestly. Like the boom was mid 2000s, mm. but like. When basically U.S. Office was like the first big one, I think, from what yeah. I can recall. But then like Modern Family and Parks and Rec were not far behind. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So yes, highly recommend that if you like your mockumentary styles. Mm. Uh, on the other side of things, if you're more akin to the supernatural uh, slice of life mm. style TV shows, I highly recommend another British uh, short run series called Ghosts. Mm. Okay. It is created by the. Uh, creative team behind stuff like Horrible Histories and Yonderland and Bill. Uh, and basic, it's a bit more, it's like their first properly like adult TV show mm-hmm. one. And it's about a series of ghosts all living and haunting the same house. Oh, okay. As a new, uh, a new cup, young couple mm. sort of move in and attempt to turn it into a hotel. Oh, so like Beetlejuice, basically. Yeah, a little bit like okay, that. Okay, cool. And so it's just all these different eras of people all trying to sort of live together and mm. the uh, lady of the couple is the first to actually notice the ghost mm. and is like bumps her head and can actually like suddenly talk and see them. Mm. And yeah, it's just a whole little slice of life. It's got great little moments like uh, the uh, general uh, character sitting down and watching Friends just because mm. she needed them out of their out of her hair for a bit, sure, sure, uh, and such, and the fantastic character of the '90s uh, American uh, senator, mm. who is entirely just in a suit, uh, jacket, and top, and without pants, <laughs> because he died in a sex scandal. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> and of course, the the sort of French monarch who had his head chopped off and so now just has a body that just wanders around the house and his head always getting lost that and such. Sounds pretty appropriate, honestly, yeah. Yeah, so highly recommend mm. that as well if you're looking for your more supernatural slice of life. Mm, delightful. Never heard of it as well, but it does sound mm. really nice. Yeah, cool. Oh, thank you to everyone who listened to this episode of Medium Shift. We can be found at mediumshift at gmail.com and a weird share house in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, next episode, we are going, going to be starting uh, another group of episodes, basically, centered around, ironically enough, a person that we know almost nothing about, um, in which the first film takes place um, in a galaxy far, far away with many, many planets. We are doing Valerian. Something, something, something subtitle. The Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. That's what I was, I was referencing. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, yeah. like, it's a stupidly long title, and I'm not going to give it the <laughs> satisfaction. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, so, um... Tune Valerian, in. the first episode in our Rhiannathon. <sighs> Part of me is still amazed that we're doing a whole series of episodes based around Rihanna, a person neither of us know really anything about, nope. nor listen to her music. Um, but she has been in a amusing series of films. Uh, one film in particular, which we will save to last, and quite frankly, is probably the only reason we are doing this in the <laughs> first place. Uh, for people who have listened to this podcast for long enough, I'm sure you can guess what that is. Uh, so stick around for that a few episodes down the line. But yeah, next episode, we're going to be doing Valerian and the City of a Long Subtitle. Until next time, fare thee well. You will watch the rest of our podcast. Listen, fuck. <laughs> I'm not good at hypnotism. Bam!